another Melbourne Cocoa Heads presentation, recorded live at the offices of Lookout Mobile on February the 10th, 2011. In this episode, we hear from thought worker Stuart Gladow on the topic of Frank, an open source automated user acceptance testing tool for iOS devices. far as I'd like, so I thought I'd better offer to do a talk on it and then I'll have to go and do the rest of my research. So I've had a couple of late nights actually trying to get up to speed with it all. The Frankenstein reference is from a, a comment that one of the developers of Frank made that it's not really a, a new tool so much as is joining a bunch of other open source tools together to create a monster, which is hopefully more useful than just having the, the individual bits by itself. This kind of testing isn't widely used in, in iPhone, as far as I'm aware. So I'm going to give a little bit of background on, I guess, the kind of tools that Frank tries to put together and, and why I think they're useful and why this kind of testing, I think, is valuable. Some of you probably already know this stuff and it might be boring and some of you maybe don't care about tests at all, and might, but hopefully some of you will find it interesting. So I just want to talk about why we need to have tests for this stuff. A lot of iPhone apps are, are pretty small code bases, pretty small visual footprint. and um, just one, one or two people developing it. If you get something wrong, you usually know about it. But as soon as it gets to a sort of team setting, it's kind of nice that when you make a change, you, you might have got your stuff working, but then you actually load up the app. It's broken for some reason. Something else in the, in the app is broken. So it'd be nice to have some way of actually having some assurance that the changes that you've made uh, haven't broken anything else. So that's one reason I think tests are really useful. And the other thing is the form of executable documentation. So as much as we'd like to have really detailed documentation about everything our app can do, as soon as you do that, it just gets out of date with the kind of, um, as the code changes, it's so hard to keep documentation up to date. So the idea that you can actually execute that documentation forces it to stay up to date. And I think that's um, really useful, say, for um, in a team environment for onboarding new members and things like that. You can actually say, well, here's everything the app does. So on the real estate app, we don't have a lot of automated testing, but we actually have full test suites that describe all the behaviour of the app so that if someone started on the project you actually say here's everything that the app does, at least that we've, <laughs> we've thought about and I'm sure it's not 100% covered. So yeah, I think that makes a big difference to sort of onboarding new members and, and training people about what the app uh, does. So um, there's a whole range of testing approaches and I think you know in the iPhone community, maybe from not testing at all to you know, having full automated suites and, and QAs that go through and really hammer the app. So I think we'll just talk a little bit about the kind of approaches we can have to testing. So I think most of the time we make a change, we bring up the app, we play with it a little bit, and then we make this statement, it, it seems to be working. I don't think I actually broke anything. We might even send it off to the client and say, here's the latest version, have a play around, uh, see what you think. Um, but when we do that kind of testing, the statement that we're really making is nothing's obviously broken. And I think if you send an app to a client with a statement, have a play around with this, you know, it's, nothing's obviously broken, but you know, I haven't actually checked everything. They probably wouldn't be too happy, and I think we do that a lot. So I'd like to go to a, to a higher level where you can actually get a bit more coverage over your app. So if you just think of your iPhone app, uh, maybe not instead of one big block, maybe we can actually try and split that up and get a little bit more coverage and maybe test some components of it and, and give us a bit more assurance that way because we know it's quite hard to actually drive the app to do that kind of thing. So I might say, okay, well, a lot of iPhone apps have, have a server behind it. We can say, well, the iPhone app's hard to test, but a computer, uh, the server is sort of a computer talking to another computer, so it's likely to have a well-defined protocol, um, well-defined behaviour, inputs and outputs. And so sort of think testing on this Call that done. What I mean by done is I think it's a, a solved problem. I'm not saying that we all have 100% test coverage on our server code and nothing ever breaks with it, but I think we sort of have a fair idea of how you can test um, the, the back end code and, and especially in the, the Ruby community where there's quite a strong culture of uh, automated testing. I think we, we sort of know how to have continuous integration servers that run proper tests against our app and do that kind of thing. 
um, but the iPhone app, uh, we're still a little bit unsure how to test that. So maybe we can break the iPhone app up into smaller components and, and um, see if there's bits that we can test to sort of, well, make sure that nothing's completely broken. So does the sort of MVC architecture that is quite common in iPhone apps, does that help us do it? So if we think about the iPhone app as having a sort of a view controller um, and a model and, and a server in behind it, well, if we break that up a little bit more, the, the server was sort of talked about, we think, you know, we can test the server. The model, again, is sort of computers talking to computers. It's just, you know, objects and messages getting passed around. And I think that we, we sort of have a fair idea of how to, how to test the models. And there's, there's reasonable unit testing and mocking libraries for the iPhone. On the project of real estate, we're using GH unit and OCMock. And I think we, we have a fair confidence in our model code that we're getting good test coverage and we're sort of covering the behavior of the app. But there's all this stuff above it, a lot of the view controller stuff that we're really not sure how to test. It's actually, I'd say, quite a lot of code. So I think um, we don't use Interface Builder. I'm not sure whether it changes a lot if you do, but quite a lot of the base of the code of the app is actually in this view controller stuff, which is kind of hard to, hard to test. So I'm going to hazard a guess that it's about 50% of our code. So I think one of the dangers of it's quite hard to test you know, driving the UI and it's quite hard to test different components is that you fall into a habit of not testing anything. So where you can actually yeah, keep your controllers really dumb and your views really pure presentation of some data. So in terms of testing this view controller stuff, I actually want to you know, have a, I guess, an analogy of like a web driver, Selenium kind of thing. We're actually remote driving the app. And um, there's a, a bunch of potential tools. I haven't looked into all of these in detail, but I'm just sort of looking around at what kind of tools people are using. Um, for the Frank and UI spec, which I'm going to talk about in more detail, so I won't talk about it here. But that's the tool that I think we've had a quick look at and we think is the, the most promising from our perspective. I shouldn't talk on behalf of our team. From my perspective, I, quite, I think you, Frank and UI spec are quite useful. Um, Sakuli, has anyone used Sakuli here? I've never used it either, but I, just from a quick read, it seems to use sort of image analysis and pattern recognition. So you can actually sort of take screenshots and say, you know, when a button that looks like this appears, then do this. And it seems kind of cool because you can sort of test anything with a library like that. But it also seems like it's going to make a really fragile test base. You know, the iPhone design t changes all the time. You get on the phone, you give it to someone, and they play with it and say, no, nah, change it all, redesign it. Yeah. So I kind of feel like that image analysis based thing is um, a little bit fragile. I don't think you could run on the device very easily unless you jailbroke it and ran a VNC server on it. So I haven't had a good look at Sakuli. I, I don't think it's really the right solution for the iPhone. Uh, Phone Monkey seems to have come from more of a, like a, a record and playback kind of mentality. The, I don't know if anyone's used it, it might know more, but it seems like you sort of run up the app and do a bunch of actions and it enables you to replay that and sort of run the test suite that way. That seems like it'd be, it'd be kind of useful and kind of quick to set up, and maybe it's not super technical. Um, but again, I feel like that kind of record and playback leads to fairly fragile tests as things uh, change and move around the screen and you change the structure of your uh, views. Two that I think are, are quite um, promising, Brominet and IQ, uh, seem to have a fairly similar concept to the way Frank's structured. But the idea is that it sort of embeds a server in your app and you can talk to it and it gives you an XML representation of your view. And you can sort of run XPath queries against that and try and verify the state of your app through that. And I think that's got a lot of promise. I, I'm not convinced that doing it with XML and XPath is the, the best way of doing it. But they're, they're definitely worth uh, looking into as well. I'm pretty sure they're both up on GitHub and, and if you want to have a look at them. And the, the UI automation stuff is the stuff that Apple brought out probably with OS 4, that March last year or something. And um, Chef and I had a look at it for a couple of days last year and we set up some uh, JavaScript tests and um, Jasmine, there was a sort of port of Jasmine for iPhones so you could run sort of JavaScript, sort of like RSpec style um, tests against your app. And actually running the test was reasonably promising. You could actually, we got quite a long way. The problem was actually running those tests that it, it was ported as an instrument. So you had to bring it up in instruments and you had to find the target that you wanted to connect it to and 
get the JavaScript, and we couldn't work out any consistent way of actually doing this automatically. Um, and you can't Apple script instruments or something. At least at that time, you couldn't. So even if you ran it in the CI box, someone would still have to come over and press Command R at some stage to run the test. But I think that's got a lot of promise going forward. And Apple, that seems to be the way Apple's going. But at least when we looked at it last year, it was just too immature, and there was just no community behind it. You Googled something, you didn't find any answers. So we sort of gave up on that. So UI spec, I think, shows a bit of promise. And um, so it's a way, it's sort of inspired by R spec and the kind of BDD stuff. And it's in Objective-C, and it's a way of sort of trying to drive your app from a suite within Objective-C. And so just so we actually have some code in my talk, I didn't want to dumb it down too much. I guess this is a sample test that you could have in, in UI spec. So trying to describe the behavior of what should happen you, and you're looking for a text label and there's a certain syntax that you have and you can say, well, that should exist and try and verify the state of your app in that way. And obviously you'd have some actions to actually cause that to happen. So you're actually testing some behaviour in the app. So this looks really promising. The, the two issues with this one, I think, is um, sort of second-hand information from uh, Perrin Fowler, who some of you will know. He's actually a committer on UI spec, UI spec, but he's never actually done a commit. So if you have any problems with UI spec, just bug pairs and see if you can uh, get him to do some work on it. So that's the one problem he had was that it was really hard to run as part of a, a build. They sort of ran within Xcode and it output stuff to the console and you could sort of run the test, but if your build broke, you didn't really know why or what caused it. So it was quite difficult from that respect. And the other one was that I think for your test, it's really good if your tests are business readable. So the people that are actually driving the requirements of your app can actually read the, the test that you're writing. If you want it to be good documentation of the app, um, I don't think the business necessarily needs to be able to write the tests, but I think they should be able to read them. So those two issues with UI spec, I think, are what uh, Frank is trying to solve. They are being able to run it as part of a build and having uh, readable tests. Um, so just an example, this is a little bit blurry because I grabbed it off the UI spec website and blew it up a little bit. But the kind of idea that your output just comes out in the console here. If something goes wrong, it's um, yeah, fairly difficult to, to know from a build uh, what happened. One of the solutions to, to business readable tests, I think, is Cucumber. And um, I guess some of you here that come from the Ruby community probably know far more about this stuff than I do. But there's also probably people here that have never heard of it. So I'll just briefly go through the, the concept of Cucumber, which I guess is trying to have tests against your app that um, are just in plain English. So the sort of business analysts and the, the clients can actually sort of help you in writing or reading these tests and, and going through and understanding what the app's meant to do. So you might have some certain scenario that you're testing and then you'll have a, a test that just follows a really basic sort of regex kind of structure. And you can say, given some statement, you put the app into a known state with, with a, a series of given steps. And then we might say, okay, well, given we're in that state, when we do something, maybe when we tap on a button, or when we hit a delete key, or we um, type some text, when that happens, then there's a certain outcome, um, and we can verify that. So, and if you want to link these together, you can sort of have ands or buts and things like that. So you have given this and that and that. And and so the idea is that your you, your tests are really easy to read, and that someone who understands using the app can actually come along and actually understand that you know, this shouldn't talk about, I guess, specific views and structures and controllers. It should be at the level of, of someone that's actually pressing buttons on the screen and doesn't actually know about the code behind it. So I think uh, Cucumber is, I think, a really good solution to the, the concept of having uh, business readable tests. But I should probably talk about Frank a little bit, given that that was the topic of my talk and I haven't actually um, really touched on it yet. So if we think about the, the problem that we have, we had the, the tests running on a PC somewhere and the iPhone app, and we sort of identified that UI spec is a, a reasonable way of driving the app that has a couple of issues, and Cucumber is a good way of writing tests. But we're not quite sure how to make them uh, talk together, and, and that's the problem that um, Frank is trying to solve. So. Uh, they do this by embedding a small HTTP server inside your app. So generally, you can either do that with some pre-compiled flags to actually put it in. You have a different target that's actually your test uh, target that starts up the Frank server 
as part of your main function. And so we'll have a little Frank server running inside it, and that sort of listens, ready for commands. And from Cucumber and, and writing the actual how to process those Cucumber steps in Ruby, the Frank guys have written a bunch of example steps that sort of generate JSON queries and, and, and post JSON across to the Frank server. And that then basically runs them as UI specs. So you're sort of sending UI spec commands uh, from Cucumber, at least from the, the Cucumber steps. And so it's really easy to run this stuff as part of a, a build. And so as long as you can boot up the app and get the, the server there listening, you can um, write the steps and send commands to it. And it communicates on a protocol called Frankly. I think one of the, there's a couple of good things about the way Frank's done this. Um, the first thing, it uses accessibility labels. So um, there's a podcast that the Frank guys released about six months ago that um, interviews some of the developers and they go through all the reasons for why they chose to do certain things. And one of the issues they had with uh, IQ and Brominet were their, um, the concept that your tests and doing it through parsing XML are really bound to the actual nesting of the, the view hierarchy. And as soon as that changes, even if the visual appearance doesn't change, you might break all your tests. Um, so Frank wants to use accessibility labels so that your tests actually talk in the language of the sort of domain model of your app. So instead of talking about certain nestings of views, you can talk about the user's screen or the add button, and you're not talking about some weird path to try and get to that within, within the DOM. Um, I should have actually got a screenshot with the accessibility inspector on. If you go into the settings, you can do that. So you need to enable it in the, the system. If you're running on the on OS X, you need to do it in the system preferences and enable in universal access. And also on the simulator, you can go through in the settings and turn on accessibility. I think on the phone, I had a quick look and I couldn't see any settings. So is accessibility always on on the phone? No, yeah, turn on voiceover. You turn on voiceover? Yeah. OK, there you go. I haven't actually tried to run this on the device. It, it should run, but I haven't actually tried it. So we'll talk a little bit about this protocol, frankly. And when I was writing this talk, I kept on having the, the quote from uh, Gone with the Wind in my head, so I just had to put in a picture at some stage of that. And um, I started writing a little block in Objective-C, but they're really ugly, so I ended up writing in Ruby. So uh, UI spec uh, uses a query language called UI query. That was sort of what we looked at before with the you know, app.table view, and it's sort of you know, it's Objective-C with dots and square brackets everywhere. Frankly, is the same thing, but without the dots and square brackets. So if we have the UI query command that we had before, so that's quite readable to all of us. But I've, I found when I show this kind of code to non-Objective-C developers, they completely freak out. And, I'm, and I, I can't work out why, because these are guys that sort of, they, know, they probably know a bit of C, they know C++ and Ruby and Java and all these things. And suddenly, because it's got it's square brackets, so it's at symbol and a colon, um, and they completely freak out. And I'm not They're really lost. sure why. What's that? They're lost. Yeah. <laughs> um, so frankly, it's the same kind of thing without the dots and square brackets. So all our Ruby friends would be happy. So this is the kind of command you could actually send from one of these cucumber steps. And you could actually send that across, and it would sort of parse that and try and get return that element if it was visible. Another really useful little tool that comes with Frank is um, it's got this little embedded app called Symbio, which is a when you boot up the Frank server, you can actually go to the browser and just go to, you know, if you're running a simulator, you can just go to localhost on a certain port and you can actually start playing around and sending selectors. So you can sort of type the selectors in here and you know, navigation button mark add. And you can flash that. And you can, and it'll actually on the simulator, you'll see the background flash yellow. And um, I think this is a really important thing because if you want your test to not be fragile and just break because of really small changes, you want to get the most general selectors that you can. So this is a really useful tool for actually going through and trying lots of things until you get the sort of the most general selector that you can, and then maybe implement that in the tests that are going to be run over and over against your app. I sort of checked out the latest version of from. Frank from GitHub and I actually had problems running, had this sort of spinner running permanently and I couldn't get it to run anything, so I actually rolled back a few commits and they made some upgrade and broke. So maybe they should be testing Frank for itself. Um, so I guess an actual example of what this kind of stuff might look like is that 
you know, we have our cucumber step that, you know, some scenario, when I start the app, I should see the user's screen. Something really basic. There's some startup stuff. Um, and obviously, that doesn't run automatically, so we need to write a little bit of Ruby code to actually work out what, frankly, query we should send and, and execute against the app running on the phone and, and try and verify. So if you haven't done Cucumber before, don't freak out about all the regular expressions. Uh, the main thing is that you know, we pass in this, this user's thing, and we're going to run one of these little helper commands that Frank supplies with you. So you check element exists, and we're going to have a few marked users. So it passes in that. So um, this mark thing is a really useful little function that we've got in Frankly, which if you set an accessibility label, it'll use that. But if you, know, if, if you haven't, but you're looking at a text label or a button, it'll sort of fall back to the, the most likely property that you meant on that object. And that's kind of nice. So if you're actually looking at stock standard Apple UI elements, um, which have sort of text labels, you, you might not have to go through and make lots of changes to make your app testable. But even if you do, it means that it'll be very accessible to people with screen readers and things like that. So even if the test doesn't work, um, you'll probably make your app better anyway. I was going to give a quick demo of actually running it in action, um, which is probably asking for trouble. So if you check out Frank on, on GitHub, you'll actually um, comes with an example app, which is an employee admin. So let's just open that up in Xcode. So to embed the Frank server in your app, all you have to do is, um, the way it's set up in the example app is that the, the Frank target, the sort of testing target, rather than the production one, just has a separate main file. And I think in the latest version of Frank, they've actually done it with pre-compile flags, so you've just got one main file. But all it does is it, in your, your stock standard main function, it just starts up the, the Frank server and then just runs your app as usual. So that's just going to be sitting there uh, in the background. And then I'll see if I can load up the actual tests. So these are just some sample tests that come with the app. So, you know, when I touch the add users button, just going from this first test here. And I fill in these text fields and there'll be some, it's going to be sending commands to the app behind there to make all that happen. And I touch save, then I should see, I should be back on the user screen. So the idea is that I'm in this app, you can click to add a user, it'll take you to a screen, you can fill in those details. When you click save, it goes back to just the list of users. And there's a bunch of them, sort of similar functions. So let me just run that. Uh, the way the example app actually runs is um, boots it in the simulator is by Apple scripting Xcode, which is something that they're, um, is going to change very soon, and it's a little bit fragile. And if you use spaces, that actually Xcode has to be on the same space as, as um, the script when you run it. Um, one of the reasons why we're moving away from that. So let's just run Cucumber, and we'll run that feature file that we we're just looking at that has those scenarios. And this is where it'll probably go horribly wrong. So theoretically, oh, there you go. So you can see this little thing down here. That's the accessibility inspector. I wanted in all the Frank screenshots why they always have this little colored tab on the side. It's because it gets in the way. So you just go and put it off to the side. But once you turn on accessibility, that'll be there. So it boots the app. Um, you might struggle to see the um, actual test running. It's just executing those scenarios. You can see the app running over here. So I just tried to add a user and did that. And now it's just going through and just checking that the, um, when you load it up, there's a certain set of users that are, are on the screen. And as long as it's green, then all our tests are passing. So that was just testing some user validation that if we don't enter the right details, um, we get an invalid user message. So now we just went and updated the user to some new things. We go back, we need to make sure that the, the new user details are actually on the screen. Sometimes when you assert that a view is there, it gives the app the benefit of the doubt, so it'll kind of keep pinging it for a little bit, just, to, just in case you know, it's spinning cycles and it's taking a little bit longer than it expected. Uh, so sometimes when you say, I should see a view called this, it'll take a few seconds um, before it actually gives up and says, no, you failed. Um, anyway, that's just going to keep running. So I just thought um, we'd give an idea of maybe how we could test drive this thing. So we could actually write a new feature so let's add a new 
scenario on there. So what we want to do in this scenario, we're going to test that when we actually try and add a new user, if they have a password and a confirmed password, we should make sure that they're the same thing and otherwise give a, an error back to the user and say, hang on, you know, your, your two passwords have got to be the same, otherwise there's no point in having the confirmed password field. So we've put that in there. Um, we can try and run that against the app and see what happens. So if we just want to run, run one of the tests in Cucumber, we can give it the line number. So we'll just run that new test that we had. So it's going to boot up the app, try and enter a user, but it's going to enter a, the password and the confirmed password are going to be different. And so say, well, I should get an invalid user error. That was actually a bug in the app, which I fixed. I meant to undo the fix before I did this demo. Um, anyway, I won't bother going through, but the first time I ran it, it just went through and let you add the user. And I found in the Objective C code where it actually did the user, the validation of that form. Um, and it just wasn't checking that the two passwords were the same. So I added that in, reran the test, and, um, and it failed. So I'll just let it, I'll let you see it fail to kind of see the output that you get. Um, I mustn't have recompiled. Um, that was one of the other issues with the way it's run at the moment, is it doesn't always seem to rebuild. But these issues are being fixed. There we go, so it should have come up with an invalid user thing, but it actually just said, yeah, it's fine, added the user. Um, and you can see now it's kind of waiting to see this invalid user message has come up. And it gives it the benefit of the doubt. I don't quite know what the timeout is. It'll keep pinging it for a little bit. Eventually it'll say, no, nah, that message is obviously not coming up. And the test will fail, and we'll see a bunch of red texts come up. All right, the demo is too disastrous. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about what uh, the road ahead is for Frank, because obviously with the example app that comes with it, you sort of see a few of the teething issues, and when we started looking at it, we were one of the first teams outside of the development group that were trying to use it. Um, so it was tailored for what they were doing. And so obviously when other teams start to do it, you have to generalise, you have to make it more um, robust. So I think the main things are getting this up and running on the CI, CI box, so maybe running this in a headless environment and, um, and launching it you know, not, use, not Apple scripting Xcode, but um, the, the latest version that the Frank guys are using is actually using a little tool on GitHub called iPhone Sim, or iPhone Sim Launcher, something like that. I, don't, I can't remember the exact name of the tool. Um, I think it's called iPhone Sim, and it's just a little command line tool that allows you to call the iPhone simulator with, you know, OS 4, OS 4.2, with a certain app that you've compiled. So suddenly you can actually get it up and running as part of your build process. You can just have make files calling, you know, Xcode build to actually do all your compiling. And then once you've got the target, running that up in the simulator. And I think the, the Frank guys have actually done this, but it's just not in the example app yet. And I, I didn't have quite enough time to port it all in there. But that makes it a lot more reliable. You don't have those issues that you saw just before. You make a change in the code, and it's not reflected in the build. Because, you know, if your build's not reliable, there's no point in having it. So I think uh, they're the major things that are, that are upcoming for Frank. Um, one of the other features that I haven't talked about is they have an ability to re record the test runs quick time. And so if there is a test failure, then you can actually load up on your build server and have a look at a quick time movie of the app running and, and see what went wrong. Because you know, seeing a, a Ruby stack trace is not always um, useful in terms of seeing what went wrong in an app, especially when it's sort of remote client server communication. So that's sort of a brief intro to Frank. I, I didn't sort of want to go into too much detail. I think if you actually want to go through how to install it and, and look at it in a bit more detail, you can look up Frank on GitHub. They link to the various resources. There's a, a podcast, they've released some videos, and there's a couple of blog posts about it. Um, and it looks like the community's kind of expanding, and the Google group's getting more and more posts every week coming in. And um, so we really want to make this from a, a nice idea to a really robust tool that we can all use to have more reliable um, apps. We're going to make changes. Yeah, so that's Frank's. They're my details. If you want to get in touch, ask any more questions. Um, but if you post to the Frank group, if you're trying this stuff out, they're in San Francisco, so they don't reply immediately, but they reply almost that night every time with the time difference. They, um, they're really on top of it. So yeah, so I might leave it there. There's a couple of references and things like that if you want to find out more. Um, I had to make a reference to the Aspect book because it actually finally is out in hard copy. Um, if you want to find out more about Cucumber and testing and, and how to write the sort of uh, Ruby side of it properly, I think that's probably a, a good book to look at.
Yeah, something I'll leave it there. Hey, thanks for you guys. <laughs> Except for REA guys. <laughs> when, when you feel it's the best time to start introducing this into an app, like, do you feel it as soon as you start with the UI, or is it once you've started getting some iteration where you feel that it's relatively disabled? Because um, I worked on projects where we, we tried to test everything. Um, we mm -hmm. came from a Ruby shop and it's like, let's get 100% code coverage. And we just went nuts because everyone goes, oh, we're going to bring in the UI like this. And it was like, we spent more time throwing away and writing new tests than we did actually changing code. And I'm just wondering whether you have the same problem and at what point do you think you introduce this sort of thing into the app? Yeah, I think we've we're sort of faced similar problems, at least from the mentality of coming from the um, couple of guys and the least guys coming from a Ruby background and wanting to, um, like, it's much easier to test everything. It's much stronger the culture of that. I don't know if I'd really use it for test driving yet, at least not yet. Maybe when the tooling's more mature, um, but I feel like with iPhone, especially the UI level, you can do as much design as you want, and as soon as you get on the phone and show it to someone, everything changes, and suddenly, you know, you don't have this thing where you build an app and then show it to someone at the end, you, can, you know, you're giving it to all the board members, you know, any time they come past your desk, you can put the latest version on it, and they're playing around with it, and they're bored in meetings, and um, they, they want to change everything, so I think writing it too early would, would be fragile. So I think what I'd really like to use it for is more of a um, regression sweep. Once you've really got it um, triggered down, I'm not trying to test everything. Like you, you're not going to test does does the view look the way I want it, or does the, does the animation look nice? But, um, I think it's more like, say, for the real estate app, when I do a search for this, then I should get 20 results, and the addresses should be this, 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 this. And I think you can do that kind of stuff by plumbing in accessibility labels and making sure nothing's gone completely wrong. Uh, so I think I'd use it more as a, at least at this stage for a smoke test and try to avoid locking down to the structure of the UI as much as possible. There was an interview with um, the guys who wrote Cucumber and a bunch of other sort of BDD tools mm -hmm. um, by Scott Hanselman on his uh, Hanselman's podcast. And one of the big things that the guys at Cucumber find annoying is that a lot of people are using it for unit testing when they shouldn't be. Like mm -hmm. It's not designed for unit testing, it's designed for acceptance testing. Designed for sort of making sure you what, what your users want or what they get. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think like the kind of thing we're looking at where you're um, to validate the user that the two passwords need to be the same. I mean that kind of stuff should be caught down the unit level. I think the only reason to have it up at this level is for to catch any regressions, although your unit test base should catch that. But even if it's covered at the unit test, I guess providing some form of documentation. Outward facing, but yeah, I think it was well, more to catch that the user is informed that their password was wrong rather than that their password didn't match. Right? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's more what it should be tested. Yeah, so I think you really want to, um, like the point before, it's more of a smoke test and, and at a much higher level, um, not testing every little module, but testing what, how the user would use the app. Um, how many of the steps are sort of predefined, like, do you know, had? When I touch, blah blah blah. Yep. Um, and they say, how much is that from the interfaces? Um, or pre in terms of if you're using standard buttons and tables and things like that, a lot of the steps will already be there. Yep. But I think even then, you probably want to write your tests in the the language that your app is for. So, you know, I I should see a. I think one of the examples we looked at then I should be able to see a view called users. Yep. Whereas we might actually talk we're actually talking about that we're probably talking about a user screen. And we might actually map them and put some plumbing in underneath. So we might actually add some high level tests so that our tests read the way that we actually talk about the app and then underneath but, but usually it'll narrow down to the frank steps. Yep. So they have a bunch of things that sort of you know checking an element exists or touching a certain element and some gestures and, and rotating the simulator. Yep. Um, and things like that. Do things like how many cells are in a table and that kind of stuff as well? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so they, they definitely have some helpers, um, yeah. but even if you could use them directly, I'd be tempted to write yeah. one layer higher. And and you can call cucumber steps within cucumber steps. So um, you can you can easily just sort of wrap it, um, put wrapper's around these things to make it read a little bit nicer. Yeah, um, I don't think getting started with the basics of 
sort of there. Yeah. I would start, if you're going to start with this stuff, start with a really basic app, like the example one. Like we, we haven't had a lot of success trying to use it with the real estate app, which is lots of hand-drawn views and things like that. Um, and also, you know, it's using 320, so there's this big spider web of ugliness behind it. Um, so when things go wrong, you're not quite sure whether you did something wrong or whether, you know, whether it's something that you're not using Frank right or whether it's just because there's a big ball of mud called 320. Um, so I'd start with something simple, and that's what I'm trying to do, try and get a good understanding of how the library works, and then try and really get it useful on a, on a, on a bigger app. So yeah, so hopefully at some stage later in the year we'll have good stories of actually using it on a production app. Many thanks again to Stuart Gladell for presenting his thoughts on Frank. Thanks also to Lookout Mobile for hosting this event. You can find Lookout Mobile on the web at lookoutmobile.com. If you would like to know more about Melbourne Cocoa Heads, visit us on the web at melbournecocoaheads.com or follow Melbourne Cocoa on Twitter.